Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You are now tuned in to Sustainability Summit 2021. I hope you have been uh, hashtagging SAS Week 21 on all our social media platforms. Without wasting any more time, we did enjoy, or rather, I hope you enjoyed the Sustainable Water Research and Resource Seminar. Now, joining us to facilitate this incredible panel of experts, and she's an incredible uh, expert herself uh, in her industry, we have Ms. F uh, Edom or Edom Folly, Program Manager at uh, Uyilo E-Mobility Program. And she'll be facilitating the Sustainable Transport and Mobility Seminar in partnership with Sunrail. Over to you, uh, Edom, and welcome. Thank you very much for that um, lovely uh, introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this Sunrail Sustainable Transport Mobility Seminar. We have an excellent lineup of speakers for today's session who will be tackling some of the critical challenges and issues facing the transport sector today but uh, before we begin i think it would be nice if we ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves to the audience in one line tell us who you are and what you do we will first start off with uh, sashin from Sanral. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sashin Rajkumar, and I am a project engineer at Sanral. Um, I'm Kairo Stein. I'm an energy consultant, private energy consultant, focusing on industry and mining industry mostly. Uh, transportation being one of the areas in which I focus. Thank you. I'll jump in. Peter Newman, I'm from Perth, where I'm a professor of sustainability at Curtin University, and I'm also involved in the IPCC on transport. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Goss, Africa Program Director at the Institute for Transportation Development Policy, ITDP. I'm based here in Nairobi. Hi everyone, um, I'm going to jump in here. My name is Walter Adeo. I'm the Chief Executive and the Digital Leader for an organization called Kadena Growth Partners. Um, and it, it essentially the, the work that we do, uh, and, and perhaps why I'm on this panel, is, is that we, we drive uh, innovation, digital and venturing initiatives to essentially uh, get businesses to a uh, a level of resilience and relevance uh, for the digital economy within which we operate. Great, thank you. I uh, just want to make 100% sure that all these speakers have introduced themselves before we proceed. Great, I think they have. So thank you so much. We, we really are all um, experts from various, various fields. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what um, all of you have to say today. Um, just to set the scene for this session, today transport is really helping individuals access health, access jobs, help access their um, ability to get to work but it's causing a lot of traffic congestion and uh, it's predicted that there will be a 50 percent annual increase in passenger traffic and a 70 percent increase in global freight volumes from today until 2030 and 2030 is in less than 10 years time and over a billion additional cars are predicted to be on our road by 2050 and most of us are living on the African continent today and 60% of our population in Africa will be living in cities. Uh, this will all impact road transport and road transport in South Africa, for example, accounts for 91% of direct transmissions across the transport sector, primarily from the combustion of petrol and diesel. 
And since traffic congestion is also a major cause of these emissions and air pollution, it's really something to think about and something that we would need to tackle um, in the very near future and the lead up to 2030. So on that note, I will hand over to Sashin, who will give us some insights into Senral and their initiatives around encouraging the decarbonization of transport in South Africa. I will hand over to you, Sashin, and you can um, also share your screen. Thanks, Adam. I'm just trying to share my screen. It's saying host disabled participants share screening. So if I can just get some technical help there. Um, we got so that kind of, green green arrow down the bottom. Yeah, uh, Rooster, the host, host needs to allow screen share. Does Cape Media, whoever is behind Cape Media, can make the adjustment? Perhaps. Guys, uh, can you confirm if I you're going to get? It's, it's going to be sorted out shortly. If okay. we will do the right situation. But in, in the meantime, you know, I'll just give you a quick background of, of Stanrail. Um, so yeah, the statistics that you, you are painting is, um, you know, the reality of the future. And we really need to be aware if we, if we aren't, um, because these pose the real challenges that we need to address. And um, I think we need to pause and ask ourselves, you know, in everything we're doing, can we still continue with the status quo? Or do we need to come up with more innovative solutions to the problems we're trying to solve? And, and whether the problems we are solving in what we are doing um, is really solving the real problems or just symptoms of problems, especially around mobility. I yeah, see I can share my screen now, so I'll get onto that. Can you guys see my screen? Nope. Not as yet. Not yet. Okay, screen two. There we go. Awesome. Now um, got so, it. Okay, cool. So Sandral is the uh, South African National Roads um, uh, Authority, and we are in charge of about 22,000 kilometers of uh, national roads infrastructure. Now, sustainability has always been a key part of what Sandral does. In terms of the circular economy, we have always promoted the reuse, uh, recycling, and reduction of waste. And we've come a long way over the years in terms of our construction and design projects uh, in terms of uh, concrete and asphalt recycling. But the, what we're going to focus on the discussion here is this new and emerging um, uh, concept of sustainable mobility and how that relates to two of our uh, uh, core objectives. So number one being ensuring the sufficient capacity on our road network and number two being ensuring that our road network is well maintained. So I'll, I'll put together a graph just to try and explain how we meet capacity. So the bottom on the x-axis is the number of years or years and it shows time so you'll see the years there and then on the y-axis the number of vehicles on the road. Now uh, the demand of, of capacity on the road is primarily driven by passenger vehicles because I think there's more than 90 or 95 percent of the, the population of traffic is made up of passenger vehicles uh, and the other five or ten percent is a heavy vehicle. So what we, we note is that initially when a road is built, and say for example, we have a two lane road with up to 2000 uh, vehicle capacity, there's initially a slow growth of vehicles until there's urbanization and development and opportunities for, for mobility. It then grows until a point where it reaches capacity just because the road cannot handle any more vehicles. So we try to figure out at what point, um, you know, there, there needs to be a capacity upgrade and uh, we try to build the road or increase uh, the capacity uh, in that time. So here, road was built in 1990, and about 2008, uh, it needs an upgrade. What does this, what does this actually look like? So we, we built the road in 1990. It has free flow capacity. 
Um, and then by 2008, we've got traffic congestion occurring. So what do we think we need to do? We need to increase the capacity. We add more lanes as a road infrastructure provider. We increase the capacity and we're back to free flow capacity. But over time, what happens again is that we get to the point of traffic congestion and the four lanes is no longer um, sufficient to meet that, uh, that demand. Going back to the graph, um, we see the same trend follows, although it happens a bit more quicker because we're already in an urbanized area um, and, and we reach the capacity of the four lanes much sooner. And then we, we ask the question, when do we need to upgrade those four lanes? But you know, is that the right question to ask? Or is the question of upgrading capacity um, a symptomatic relief of, of a real problem? And is the real problem perhaps there's just too many cars on the road with a low occupancy? Uh, and, and specifically your, your private car owners. And if the latter is actually the core problem, what can we do to solve that problem? So here are some ideas that we are talking about at Sandral in development of our smart mobility strategy. You know, we don't just build roads to enable the growth of more cars, but we also build in micro mobility lanes for uh, pedestrian uh, uh, and, and cyclists, uh, and also the use of micro mobility vehicles like your electric bikes and uh, your electric scooters. We build in first last mile infrastructure in the form of car parks for people to park their private cars, jump in to uh, uh, high occupancy cars and carpooling, um, and also have integrated uh, connected um, uh, public transport terminals into this infrastructure. Uh, these nodes will be strategically connected to the micro mobility lanes, of course. Um, and another strategic um, objective would be to have a dedicated passenger rail that is tied to these uh, first last mile nodes. While talking about rail, we should also have a, a dedicated um, rail for freight movement, long-term freight movement, to support the transition of, from road to rail freight movement. Um, then we know that our roads have the potential to unlock development along the corridor, but it usually occurs in a very uncoordinated manner. So we need to assist municipalities to uh, have better coordination of that development so that we can future-proof uh, mobility along those corridors. In terms of offsetting carbon emissions, um, why not plant trees along our infrastructure uh, and promote indigenous trees, fruit trees, and, and especially trees that have a, a turnaround of, a, a high turnaround of CO2 to oxygen. Um, and then to radically offset those CO2s, promote the tree planting initiatives up to a kilometer on either side of the corridor into the urban developments. Uh, promote the use of renewable energy infrastructure along our road network. Again, push it alongside our corridors to radically reduce the, the uh, carbon emissions that we create on our road. Definitely the future is electric mobility, electric vehicles, so we should be supporting them. Uh, and, and one of our, our objectives that we're currently looking at is digitalizing our road or, or giving it internet uh, capability and connectivity, which will enhance our efficiency in operations and ultimately reduce uh, emissions uh, in that manner. So how do all these effects change in terms of our infrastructure and sustainability? I think the point being that we can't continue this increase in capacity because it's just not sustainable for two reasons. Um, the costs are just too high and there's usually not enough space to increase uh, the capacity. But if we have that dedicated uh, passenger rail and if we promote high occupancy vehicle usage and if we have micro mobility lanes, then we will continue to push down the, uh, the high vehicle uh, usage on our cars by allowing people other forms of mobility. And what that looks like here is that we will need to then only increase the capacity of the existing road network at a much longer period, which then increases its sustainability uh, and longevity of that infrastructure. In terms of road maintenance, our other objective, although a smaller portion of the vehicle fleet are the heavy vehicles, they contribute the most to road deterioration. Again, if we can have a rail that supports um, the, the freight movement using intermodal 
uh, technology like road railers and rail, uh, rail runners, uh, we can delay the need for maintenance. Now, delaying the need for uh, infrastructure projects means that we will reduce the, the time that we use raw materials from the earth to, to upgrade this infrastructure, again, contributing to environmental sustainability. In terms of CO2 emissions, uh, the, if we just boil the roads, we're just going to get increase in CO2 emissions. But if we promote the use of electric vehicles, we reduce it. If we promote the use of renewable energy infrastructure, we reduce it. And tree planting initiatives will further reduce it, all with the goal of ultimately achieving net zero carbon emissions. But yeah, thank you, Idem. These are some of the things that we are talking about at Samuel. I appreciate any comments or feedback. Thank you so much, um, Sashin. That was a very insightful uh, presentation into what uh, the, the initiatives that Sanral is um, working on at the moment. Um, I would like to uh, pick your brain in terms of uh, public transport. Um, at the moment, a lot of South Africans are driving in their own cars, and you touched on um, promoting high occupancy in um, vehicles. So how do we shift um, the consumer or the passenger from moving towards public transport? Because a lot of us at the moment feel that um, public transport is not safe. And um, for some people, um, they when they, they use public transport, they end up spending 40% of their wages on um, public transport. So what do you think that um, can be done in terms of this? And also looking at the congestion in terms of the minibus taxis uh, that we have on the road as well. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that. And I'm sure um, the audience uh, will be interested in that as well. Thanks, Adam. That, that is a, a brilliant question and definitely one that we, we need to address in, in this country. Um, and and I, I'm reminded of a quote by uh, a mayor of one of the Colombian states who said that a developed country is not one where the poor can afford cars, but where the rich use public transport. Now, that for me is the vision of creating that, that public transport uh, that we need for the country. Um, and what he's trying to say is build a public transport that's so, so good in terms of quality, affordability, reliability, and, and safety, that even people who can afford their own cars would choose to rather use that, that public transport. What he does not mean, and which is the other big issue that you mentioned here, is build such a good um, and expensive public transport that only the rich would use. Because an, another key aspect and a challenge would be to make sure that it is inclusive and affordable for those who spend a lot of their income uh, on public transport. So there are a number of issues that we have to address uh, in the holistic picture of this. And I believe that we basically have to start by reimagining and, and redesigning from the ground up what the future of public transport could look like. Uh, so we need to, uh, to balance the high quality and affordability issues. Uh, and then I think it's, it's, it's critical to try and then figure out how we're going to incorporate all the existing public transport stakeholders. Um, definitely in South Africa will be the, the taxi industry um, because they are doing uh, a mobility and sustainable mobility a huge good in that they move a lot of people currently um, in, in a single vehicle, so a high occupancy vehicle. Um, and I think also the future of this public transport needs to be connected and reliable uh, and, uh, and trustworthy in terms of the, the users who we want to get out of um, their private cars. Um, basically, people need to know when they can get onto the public transport and when they will arrive. And I think more important than, than being fast right now, it needs to be honest. So if I'm going to use public transport and, and, and I see on my app that I'm going to get picked up at a certain time, it's going to take me 30 minutes to get there. It must take me 30 minutes to get there, not 32, not 35, nothing longer than that. Um, and even though I have a car that will take me maybe 15 or 20 minutes to get to my destination, I may choose to use the public transport because 
of the unpredictable traffic uh, congestion problems that we have on our roads. So, so that's what I believe we, we need to, to look at as the future of public transport. But also I think, in, you know, in terms of sustainability, that public transport system should be electric and it needs to be powered by renewable energy. Thanks, Ida. Thank you so much, Sashin, and very valid points raised indeed. Um, it's really looking at decongesting our roads and also encouraging people to actually use um, uh, public transport because, you know, buying or getting more cars on the road, even though they're electric, it's, it's still, it's still, there'll still be congestion. So it's basically a mind shift. Um, that's my take from what the information that you have shared with us thus far. And uh, thank you so much. I am now going to hand over to Carl Sneeman, who is an energy expert. Um, energy consumption in road transport is mainly from uh, passenger cars and uh, not necessarily uh, freight. So um, we will hear from what uh, Carl has to say in relation to energy efficiency and vehicles. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, Carl. Thank you. Uh, let me just move it out of the way. Uh, right. uh, thank you for the opportunity to present something. Um, and, and this is a little bit of an um, alternative view uh, from uh, on transportation, not the typical private and passenger vehicle, uh, electric vehicle um, approach. But generally speaking, the um, efficient transport is more important than really looking at electric vehicles. Uh, and, and, I, and I've been involved with electric vehicles since the early 1990s with Carl Sneijman. And I'm Carl Stein, not Carl Stein, and I'm, I'm well, a good friend of mine. But, but certainly, um, we've been involved since those days on, on, on electric vehicles. Um, most people would prefer electric vehicles. I'm sure I would love to have an electric vehicle. But the problem is, if you look at electric vehicles, the typical passenger and private vehicles, even the small ones is expensive. And, and you need infrastructure for that. And, Typically, it's, if you look at the vehicles, you can see it's expensive. Electric vehicles are expensive vehicles. It's, it's not for the, for the run of the mill uh, purchased or uh, consumer or buyer. So typically, this happens. We only, we only sold 92 electric vehicles last year in South Africa. If you consider in a typical year, we sell 500,000 vehicles in a year, which means 92 vehicles is not even 0.02% of the total number of vehicles uh, being sold. So electric vehicle market. And that's after 30 years of, of working in this market and working on electric vehicles in South Africa, we're still struggling to get them sold. And there's many reasons for that. And there's valid reasons. And, and something needs to be done in that regards. But looking at an alternative approach, the larger polluters are not usually, and you shouldn't look at the most, the vehicles, the most vehicles on the roads as to uh, are they the biggest polluters? You should look at the highest consumption of energy, which emits the most uh, uh, pollutants. And we know that diesel is the uh, amount of um, fuel that's mostly being used, especially for freight transport, freight and large vehicles. Passenger vehicles, of course, there's some of them that have uh, diesel. But the amount of fuel being used by the freight transporters and, and other large heavy haulers is much more in comparison to um, the, the normal EV market that we're looking at. And this is the fuel graph for last year taken from the MRE. And you can see it was an unusual year. The diesel consumption was, uh, actually fuel consumption was more or less half of what it is normally in a normal year. And in this case, you can see, even in this uh, situation, the diesel consumption was substantially higher than any other 
fuel source. So there should be a focus on diesel, on, on diesel. And, and that is rightly so because it's quite a huge opportunity. Here. If we look at the technologies then as to which can be used to replace uh, heavy oil um, trucks uh, like freight and, and mining and factories. Um, the first one is obviously electric locos and changing electric locos and typically large uh, trucks and many other types of uh, heavy oil technologies from diesel to electricity is actually quite simple and easy. Often it's just replacing the supply of of energy to the motors because often they have motors installed already. Locos, for instance, has a diesel generate a diesel engine driving a, a alternator or generator to generate power to provide to the motors for the wheels. In trucks, often it happens that um, a diesel engine drives a diesel uh, um, uh, alternator to drive hydraulics. So it's, it's quite easy to. And it's electric, electric locos has been in, in existence for many, many years. Conveyor systems, it's a transport system. You can replace, why are we in this country using trucks to transport coal from the mines to, to the power stations? The world over, the, the power stations have been built on or, or very close to the uh, coal fields, and therefore conveyor systems can and should be used. And in this country, we're not using it. In fact, some of these trucks are driving next to the conveyor systems, the old, techno, old, old conveyor systems. There's, heavy, uh, there's new technologies as well. This is one, a railway system, which is very efficient and works very well and with huge quantities. Of course, you can get new technologies in this sector as well. And this, refers, this picture refers to um, battery electric trucks and many other uh, trackless mining vehicles. And although it looks like a, a toy, in fact, it's not a toy, it works extremely well. And there's other huge benefits in using those technologies, and I'll get to some of them later. Then there's agile technologies like rail, uh, aerial railways and rail conveyor systems, which are in use in some places, but not as in many places as it can be and should be. Pipe and tube, tube transport, we can make a lot more use of this. In not all respects, it is useful because sometimes you need water to transport the, the product, but often you can transport the product itself easily in the pipe. And in South Africa, we're doing that with fuel from Durban to Gauteng. So the trucks are being used in open cast mines and you get these trucks for freight as well on open roads and it's being used in Europe extensively. We have trolley trucks uh, linking to power directly. And it's exactly the same as with the electric logos uh, I mentioned. Of course, there's other transport methods as well. I've not included many of the others. The logs are one, uh, not really suitable for South Africa because you need lots of water to transport lots. So easier, it's easier to convert heavy oil heavy duty transportation and there's many reasons for this and let me include one or uh, a few uh, reasons why there's lots of older trial and tested technologies that can be used to replace diesel trucks or diesel usage in trucks it's much larger and quicker to, uh, the impacts are much larger and quicker because of the fact the amount of diesel that's been used and one track uses a lot more diesel than quite a number of uh, uh, private vehicles. The effort could, to convert these to, elect to electric or other cleaner technologies, and I've not even touched on newer technologies that are being developed like ammonia or hydrogen, um, is very, is often quite low. It's easy to replace them because it makes business sense. There's large Secondary benefits involved in converting these vehicles. Um, for an example, just one example, that um, truck that I showed you, the battery electric trucks. When you use these under, uh, under, in, in, under mines, in mine shafts, um, often you need up to 50% less cooling and ventilation in those mines. And using less ventilation and cooling 
cuts your energy used dramatically in, in that respect. Then. So you actually have a double saving impact uh, on, on energy and uh, emissions. Often the CAPEX and OPEX are tax deductible, which is usually not the case for private vehicles. Uh, and, and businesses are in the business of, of um, deducting the costs and um, expenditures from taxation. So they do get a benefit there. And then there's pressure from international markets for businesses to convert to cleaner fuels. So it's a natural um, focus area for heavy oilers to, to look at so, solutions there. And the same with investors. In South Africa, we already have tax incentives and grants that is available and being used to convert or replace these vehicles. And, and they can a lot more can be done to get this done. You don't need a, a national charging infrastructure when you replace these trucks. Um, often in the next line shows, it's easy and, and you can do, use green charging with multiple batteries per vehicle to, to uh, uh, use per, per truck or, or less. Which means that um, you can have depots or specific locations where vehicles can, batteries can be exchanged and they don't need to wait for that. So there's no time wasting uh, charging batteries. Looking at the graph and this work has been done, um, you can see the cost of all the various energy sources compared to each other. And typically you can see that the cleaner solutions is actually quite, quite a lot cheaper to, to uh, use than other alternatives. And that's it for me. Um, and I must um, use this opportunity to also market the uh, Southern African Energy Efficiency Convention uh, Federations Conference um, on the 3rd and 5th of November. Uh, you're welcome to join us there as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity. If there's any questions, I'll take those now. Great. Uh, thank you so much, um, Carl, for that uh, interesting um, presentation. What we will do is we will hang on um, for questions later on in the discussion. Um, we will now um, move on to Christopher, who is um, an expert on initiatives that are taking place around the continent in um, relation to uh, sustainable mobility solutions. So if uh, Christopher can um, share his screen. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Adam, and, and great to be here with everyone. So I want to focus on the urban mobility part of this equation, um, because if we really want our cities to drive economic growth and provide opportunities, we really need to change the way that we're thinking about urban mobility. If, if you look around the region, this is how people travel. We have a lot of trips by foot. We also have people using public transport and only a small minority using cars. And you can see here in Nairobi, it's 13%. In a city like Mombasa, only 3% using cars. And when you look at the way the infrastructure is being designed, um, it's favoring that small minority, right? So as Sashin said, you know, this practice of just building wider and wider roads in order to respond to this problem is not leading to a long-term solution, right? So when we build these wide roads, especially in urban areas, they offer really short-term benefits. They simply attract more traffic and, and fill up. And so you end up with back at the same level of congestion, but with more vehicles stuck in traffic. And they're obviously competing with public transport. And so if we have a goal of encouraging the use of sustainable mobility, the more that we build these roads and elevated highways and flyovers, um, the more that we're going against those efforts to, to promote green and equitable mobility in our cities. So if, if we really want to use road space efficiently, we have to carve out dedicated space, especially for public transport and also for pedestrians and cyclists. So you can see here, you know, a lot of cities try to build flyovers or elevated roads. 
it only leads to very small short-term capacity increase. You know, if we, if we really want to see an order of magnitude increase in the number of people we can carry, not just vehicles, then we need to have dedicated lanes for public transport, and especially in the form of BRT. And an example of a city that's done that is Dar es Salaam, where you can see that this corridor has a wide walkway. It also has the dedicated cycle tracks. And there's dedicated space in the median for the BRT system. And after all that's provided, there, there are the two lanes for mixed traffic. So it's really changing the priorities in the way that the street space is allocated so that we can actually start moving people and, and not just more cars. But BRT is more than just bus lanes. So it, it means having this whole system where we have the high quality stations, we have prepayment, um, an off-board fare collection, a dedicated fleet of high quality buses, and also the last mile access. So having good walkways and cycle tracks and good pedestrian crossings so that people can access the stations. Now in, in Dar es Salaam, the system's been a big success. So it, it, it's carried you know, it, upwards of 170,000. Um, you know, Pre-COVID, it was even over 200,000 passengers per day on the first phase corridor. Um, and it's been able to cut travel times from two hours to 45 minutes in, in one direction. So you can imagine how that expands the labor market in the city and allows the city to, to perform more uh, efficiently and give more people access to those opportunities. You know, this was the, the you know, typical environment where people had to wait for the bus and the system's able to offer this really high quality station environment. And this is important not only for providing universal access so that the, the system can be used by anyone, but also to speed up the boarding you know, because in a public transport system like this, the, the delays, the two sources of delay are at the stations and at the intersections. So we need to address both of them. And by having level boarding, you, you allow people to get on and off of the buses much faster and you can process a higher volume of them. Now, a, a lot of times people think that this type of system needs really wide roads, but you can see how Dar es Salaam was able to tra transform the city center um, where Morgo Road goes into this very narrow section. And this is what it looked like before with a lot of parked vehicles um, and not very nice space for people to walk. And now the city's been able to transform that into this dedicated corridor for buses, pedestrians, and cyclists. And, and so it's, it's not a question of, of, you know, of engineering or geometry. It's really a political question of whether we're willing to prioritize the majority of the commuters by, by allocating space for public transport. Now, besides all these infrastructure questions, I also wanted to mention the, the, the softer side, um, the business model for public transport, because building a BRT is not just a matter of you know, setting up the, the dedicated lanes and getting a new fleet, but we also have to make sure that we have a good business model behind it. And that means making that transformation from the, the net cost contract, you know, the target system that we have now in many of our cities where our public transport operators uh, incomes are dependent on the number of people they carry each day. Um, and that leads to the kinds of problems we see, you know, the road safety challenges, the, you know, in many cases, poor customer service, dilapidated vehicles. And we need to change that to a model where we're incentivizing the right things right, where it, the incentive is no longer how many people you pick up, but things like safety and the fact that you delivered the service effectively that day. So this means having the, the fares go to a trust fund and then having the operators paid out of that trust fund by kilometer um, so that they, they're incentivized to provide high quality service. So let's change what we're doing. You know, we we're in still in too many cases, we're making big investments, um, just thinking of cities as places for cars. And that's leading to predictable results, you know, more traffic jams, more pollution. So let's change that to thinking about denser cities um, and really designing for people instead of cars. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Christopher, um, for that um, insightful presentation. Um, before we move on to our last two speakers, I would just like to touch on a few um, points that were raised by uh, Carl, and um, Sashin and Christopher, just looking um, at the African perspective when it comes to uh, mobility. 
Um, uh, Carl, you had a very interesting take in terms of um, electrifying heavy duty transport. Now, when we look at um, when we look at heavy duty transport, are you referring to just the um, locomotives? Or are you also looking at the electrification of buses um, and uh, a road rail? And um, how do we all um, integrate this into um, the mandate that a lot of governments have at the moment in um, the adoption of um, electrical vehicles and um, especially passenger electrical vehicles? because there's this drive to increase the um, uptake of electric vehicles. And then there is the drive to um, the conversion of heavy uh, duty transport. So how do we merge and um, marry the two to come to some kind of uh, integrated um, solution? Eden, thank you for the question. Um, you're right. Um, I must be. I must mention that I did not uh, refer to electrification only. I'm talking about cleaner, cleaner technologies, cleaner mobility. Um, hydrogen and ammonia is probably going to be the energies of the future. Electrification is still dirty in many instances compared to um, those technologies, especially in South Africa for for the medium to long term future. Um, if you look at the other two presenters, we all almost saying the same thing: less uh, private vehicles on the roads. But we're spending most of our effort and time on private vehicles in this country. We've wasted our time. Thirty years we've wasted. And what do we have to show for it? Ninety-two vehicles sold last year. If you look at the work I've done. In one year, in comparison, it's it's not you can't even compare it. I've I've saved a lot more emissions than your 92 vehicles last year, or all the vehicles that you've sold the last 30 years. What am I saying? Heavy or the vehicles are the focus, or supposed to be the focus of of government. And that's exactly what the other the, the presenter has just showed us. Buses are a heavy oil vehicle. It's taking more than one person or two persons in a vehicle. Same with uh, uh, railways, same with uh, uh, freight, uh, uh, moving freight in, in open cost mines, in even deep level mines. We use different methods, and often it's diesel and petrol and these type of dirty energy sources that we're using to transport people, which is, is actually wrong. So we should be focusing our energies and our efforts where it makes an impact. We can't afford to waste another 30 years to get a vehicle up and running. There's a lot of efforts there. And, and I'm not against uh, private, uh, private electric vehicles. I'm not. I would love to have one. But why do I not have one? Because it's too bloody expensive. Let's be honest and open and frank about it. And then I need to worry about range if I can get where I want to in, in one charge. And if I want to charge, I must build in time to charge. And the cost, the way things are going in this country, electricity might be more expensive than diesel if we don't watch out soon. Because the levies and everything else needs to be added to, to that as well. So certainly it's not, it's not a simple uh, fit, but we need to look at the longer term integrated strategy as to what can have the shortest, quickest impact and deal with that first and then look at the other uh, uh, solutions. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we should ignore EVs, but certainly we have other areas we should focus on. Okay, um, thanks so much for your uh, very interesting take, Carl. Um, uh, Sashin and Christopher, do you have any um, comments on what Carl has to say? I do know that the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition has brought out a auto green paper for new energy vehicles uh, towards a framework for um, electrifying vehicles. 
uh, particularly because they would um, are aware that uh, the rest of the world is going through or going towards electrification and they might lose their critical um, export markets such as the EU and um, the USA. So I will first um, hand over to uh, Sashin to give your viewpoint and then Christopher to let us know what is happening in the rest of the continent um, towards uh, sustainable um, mobility and um, in line with um, what Carl has said, do you have the same viewpoint or maybe opposite viewpoints? So I'll start off with um, Sashin. Thanks, Idam. And uh, thanks, Carl, uh, for your openness and frankness uh, about in the discussion. I think that's the reality of most South Africans. You know, when you ask why don't we have EVs, uh, it's, it's just not affordable for everyone. Um, and you know, you, you, you're questioning why does it take so long? What has been done in the last 30 years? Good questions. Um, but I think the, the thinking wasn't there. But I think the light now is that the thinking is coming in uh, in the industry and in the rest of government. Like uh, Ida mentioned now, the Auto Green paper, be it a bit later than the rest of the world. But I think South Africa and the government is moving in the right direction. We just need to keep on pushing uh, internally from where I am and also the private sector um, to see the change that we want. And I also appreciate you know, the, the points that you're bringing. Um, it's, it's, the world is looking at electrification, but you are saying, hang on, you know, there are other low-hanging fruits and the other things that we can do that will help us achieve net zero much quicker. Uh, and it's much more achievable. And we need to incorporate those in, in our government strategies as well. Um, and in terms of uh, affordability in the manufacture of electric vehicles, these are all things that are, I'm, I'm hoping that the um, uh, government will start to pursue uh, because it, it presents a lot of major challenges for the country if we don't. Um, and from Samuel's point of view, you know, we, we were before only here to build roads. But now we are expanding our mindset to moving away from just roads for cars to mobility for people and, and talking about these things. Like we've got a 30 billion rand project down in, in Durban where we are expanding the N3. But we are saying that that's not going to be sustainable after it's expanded. So we need to start putting in other infrastructure now. We're also looking at electrification and, and, and dealing with range anxiety, especially on our routes. So we've got a pilot project to put up electric uh, charges and, and also look to work with private sector um, to help um, with uh, electrification of, of uh, vehicles and, and that sort of infrastructure. Thanks, Ilm. Thanks so much, Sashin. And uh, Christopher, I'd love to get some insights from you on, on what is happening across the continent in places like uh, Rwanda, uh, Egypt, um, Uganda, in terms of uh, sustainable mobility and sustainable uh, uh, transport, and maybe um, uh, touch on some of the issues that uh, Carl and um, Sashin have addressed or you can unpack or let us know if you have a, a different or the same viewpoints. Sure. Uh, well, I definitely agree on this point that uh, electric vehicles are part of the solution, but they're not sufficient to, you know, to address the climate crisis. And we have to really uh, encourage mode shift in, as well and make, make our streets safe for people to walk and cycle. Um, which you you know you can't say about many places in Nairobi um, and many other cities around the region. So that needs to change, and we we need to look at um, you know not see. I think the focus in many cities is still on encouraging really fast movement for cars, right? So we think of all the urban streets as highways, and we need to you know convert them to freeways so that we can you know get as many cars blasting through at high speed. So that has to change. Like we need to acknowledge that the you know cars are, are only used by a minority of residents in most cities. And we, we have to start addressing the, the way that most people are traveling. And then I think the other part of it that, that's especially critical in the South African context is thinking about land use. Um, and I'm sure Peter will speak more about this in, in his session, but you know, we need to move away from you know, the really sprawling development and, and, you know, and thinking of the, the, the only approach to affordable housing production is to have very low density development that's stretching further and further out from job centers. Like that really has to change. Like we have to 
start um, you know finding more ways to unlock more compact forms of development um, in you know in many cities around the continent we don't have good street grids and so that that inhibits densification you know because there's a lack of clarity on uh, you know on where the where you can develop you know because people don't know okay maybe tomorrow a new road will be put through and so i'll lose my property so we have to eliminate that uncertainty by you know by having you know proper development of street networks we have to retrofit where they don't exist and and that way we can make use of the infrastructure and in parts of our cities that are serviced that you know that have water mains and sewer lines and everything then we can allow those areas to densify so that we don't continue to see this sprawl that's, you know, increasing trip distances, the cost and everything, and, and making our cities less sustainable. Great. Um, thank you so much to uh, Carl and to Sashin and to Christopher. Some very interesting points were raised. Um, we will now uh, hand over to Peter uh, to talk about uh, sustainable development and cities and how do we get to a net zero. Over to you, Peter. Okay, thank you. And um... Let me just qu quickly go through the slides because there's lots to talk about from all of that. Uh, we are rapidly moving towards the need for net zero. It's not just an IPCC agenda now, it is clearly a finance one. If you look at that website, Climate 100 Plus, there's $55 trillion of finance now set aside in the world to achieve net zero because the next economy is emerging very rapidly. Um, and it is something that emerges after economic decline. This sixth wave of innovation is something that you can trace in history, but you, the new technologies are emerging. And let me just show you this. The, um, the cost of solar is now cheaper than any other form of energy in the history of the world. It has dropped in 10 years, 89%. Uh, on on off onshore wind as well, so we now have a situation where the clearly the future is not going to be about gas or nuclear, even solar thermal or coal. Onshore wind and solar photovoltaics are dramatically happening uh, around the world. So what we've got is renewables and sorry, renewables, batteries, ele and electric vehicles associated with them. Uh, some cynicism about the cost of these. My problem is slightly different. The cost of electric vehicles are coming down so rapidly, like that solar curve. They are going to be very cheap, and they're very cheap to run because solar is so cheap. So we could have a huge problem with cars in our cities because they are so cheap to run and, and to even to own, because they don't run out like, uh, they don't, they're easier to maintain than anything. But electric vehicles can be transit and can be micro mobility, as everyone has said, and we've got to do that. And we've got to integrate them into our cities. So we've got projects now which have shown how to do net zero developments. Things that are sharing solar, sharing electric vehicles and doing it in a smart way so everybody is gaining from it they are affordable housing projects and we've shown that you can do it in a, a number of places like the south african townships they are ideal because you've got to have a strong community to make it work and they are small scale technologies the it, the, the energy and water and waste systems uh, can fit into these structures. You don't knock them down and start with big high rise. This is the way to do it. And the transport for it can be part of this challenge of electrifying as well. You can have small scale electric vehicles, of course, but the one that I think is really important to see is this trackless tram. This is a Chinese invention and it's, it, it, the. Uh, in Europe and America, 
they're starting to see the advantages of this. You've got batteries on the roof, no need for the electric catenary. It's not got steel, steel wheels on steel tracks. It looks like a light rail, but it's not. It is, in fact, a transformed bus. It, you can fit it into BRTs and so on, but it is following a painted white line. It has its own optical guidance system. These are emerging as the kind of very cheap uh, but very attractive options for cities. And this can carry six lanes of traffic in that vehicle. So we've looked at how to do this in various places, and one of them is Bulawayo. It's very clear that it would fit in there, and it can be integrated into how you do solar energy in, in a uh, transit mall. So it can be helped with financing as well. So the land development opportunities that are created by this sort of technology, pay for it. And so that means you put in your solar and at the depot where these things are, you can have your own solar on the rooftop there. So you're not having to get into the dirty coal-based grid for this. It can run off its own solar-based system in the depot and at various points along it can be recharged in 30 seconds. So this is the kind of technology that's emerging and we've got to start to see that in the next 20 years, that's going to dominate our cities and we need to prepare for it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Looking forward to the, um, the discussions which will be coming up next. Our last um, presentation is going to be from uh, Walter. And then straight after that, we will kick on to further discussions and pick up on the earlier comments and challenges that were raised from the previous speakers. Thank you, Dem. I, I'm not going to do a presentation uh, as everyone else did, as I indicated to you, but rather to reflect on some of the points that, that have been said. Um, and then maybe add a few additional data points that might uh, uh, allow for a, a robust uh, debate afterwards. Perhaps as a start, as a disclaimer, is that the lens at which I view the world is through you know, trying to apply exponential business models or digital business models to the current constraints and challenges that we have, so that what we do build has got relevance and resilience uh, and, and longevity uh, in, in this new uh, economy uh, that, that um, that, that we live in. It's interesting to see Peter's slide around you know, digital, the digital economy sort of having peaked and now we're in this new uh, wave. And, and I don't disagree with that at all, but, but we still have to have the models that are resilient into this new environment. Another thing that I did want to highlight is that none of the points that are raised are meant to invalidate any of the previous points, like I said, rather to augment the debate and, and, and drive more questions and answers. So when, when, when I looked at this topic, I, I sort of, you know, I read the future of mobility. In other words, the, the business of moving things and people from point A to point B. And, and as we all know, it is, uh, we cannot address every single element in, in an hour to hour conversation. It is a complex multi-dimensional multi conversation uh, with many different viewpoints, depending on the industry that you're in, the problem that you're trying to solve for, et cetera. Uh, is your starting point moving people, maintaining infrastructure, developing smart cities, or decarbonizing uh, the economy? Irrespective, I think the important thing to note here is that transportation, infrastructure, and mobility remains the bedrock of any effective economy. Without an effective uh, and, and sustainable uh, mode of transportation or transportation infrastructure, the best economic plans won't deliver the, the required results. So if we move beyond the, the, the theme of infrastructure and look at the broader theme of mobility. Um, a couple of things, you know, a, a couple of additional things, things to consider for the audience. It's, it's about, you know, it's going beyond vehicles only and, and looking at you know, our traditional definition of vehicles and probably looking at alternative personal mobility solutions, which is not, yeah, I see the new term being used. It's, it's moving infrastructure, uh, you know, looking at infrastructure, focusing on roads and cities, uh, and, and moving beyond the, 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 the bricks and mortar, essentially, and seeing how we make that, in, that those infrastructures uh, alive uh, in, in order to receive information and pass back information for us to ensure that uh, the infrastructure can keep us informed, can receive instructions, and can perform 
to the required uh, uh, the requirements of of economic plans. Um, and so Sheen sort of touched on that that we've got to go beyond linear thinking when it comes to infrastructure. And we need to think as far better in terms of how we optimize the investments that we make. I think an important point that certainly that I, that I had that Sashin also touched on is that um, it's not just about building more, but also integrating and densifying uh, and also going perhaps beyond road and rail as an alternative. I think decarbonization is a critical thing that we have to address as we think of future solutions and plans. And then optimization, you know, I'll, I'll put a golden thread through all these topics around optimization. Again, not just looking at optimization on how we move individuals or items, but the full optimization from a pit to port type uh, infrastructure. And again, not only does it increase the lifespan of infrastructure, reduce the cost, cost of operating that infrastructure, but it improves economic performance of the participants in that uh, transportation infrastructure. Interestingly, if I take a slight deviation, is if I reflect on uh, what's taking place uh, around the world at the moment, you know, a starting point that I looked at was who are the top companies most, or the most valuable companies in the business of people mobility? Um, and one would expect to find automotive manufacturers in there. However, when you look at the top five companies in the business of moving people, only two uh, motor manufacturers are now listed there, being uh, Toyota and Volkswagen. The, the largest uh, company in that space is Tesla, which is certainly posing a serious challenge to the traditional automotive manufacturers. And the other two participants in the top five are not even uh, car manufacturers. It's Uber, which has you know, had a valuation of over a billion dollars last I checked, and, and Didi, which is, uh, you know, I think they, they're planning to list and, and have indicated to have a similar um, uh, valuation. So we, we touched a lot on, on people mobility in our previous conversations, and I think certainly people mobility and the selling of cars has also been disrupted from, you know, owning the car to using the car. Uh, which is is quite interesting. The old debate around uh, ownership changes, which I think creates an, a, a threat to some sectors of the mobility industry, but it creates another opportunity uh, for the mobility industry. Some interesting statistics for your audience. The business of mobility, uh, as, as uh, investigated by one of the large companies in the space, was estimated to be about $5.7 trillion in terms of, uh, and, and that's made up of 20 trillion uh, people miles transported either in personal or, or in a public transport vehicles across 175 countries and, and new transport business models, autonomous business models, uh, autonomous ride hailing uh, businesses, et cetera, optimization of logistics, et cetera, is, you know, depending on who you talk to, ranges from uh, a half, you know, $500 billion uh, business worldwide to beyond uh, a trillion dollar business by 2030. So, I mean, it's, it's incredibly uh, interesting and again, just reinforces the importance uh, of all of this in our economies. From a digital model, exponential model perspective, I always look for three dividends that we've got to be looking for and focused on because the conversation can get quite complicated. And those three dividends are, can we unlock new avenues of growth or revenue or income uh, economic uh, momentum for a country or an economy? So growth, think of it as top line growth. Can we unlock it by these new business models? The next one would be productivity and efficiency. Can we increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our infrastructure and reduce the cost of, of managing and operating that infrastructure? And then can we drive a positive experience for the people that participate in that infrastructure? The more positive the experience, the greater the adoption. So, you know, uh, public transport will be, uh, I think Sashin and Chris touched on it, is that the more effective the, the public transport effect you know, is, the more people will adopt it, irrespective of where they sit in the economic um, um, spectrum. Just very quickly, you know, a couple of points from a, a, a unlocking new growth in an economy. Um, I mean, what's very interesting over the last 18 months has been the explosion of e-commerce activity. It started off in apparel, in economic apparel, food apparel, ex uh, sorry, technical apparel, food apparel. It's now progressed down the curve towards, you know, fresh food, uh, which, which basically speaks to a almost an immediate gratification, a real-time fulfillment. Uh, and in South Africa alone, you know, the e-commerce sector is expected to grow to about 94 billion rand, uh, which, it, which would suggest it's, it's growing at two to three times uh, our, our inflation rate uh, in, in the country. And, and just the online food component of it, the, the delivery of cooked food component could be in the region of 7 billion uh, rand. That is not a market that we had uh, uh, two years ago. 
Uh, worldwide, the, the, just the, the component of online food delivery, cooked food delivery, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is expected to grow to about uh, $300 billion um, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. So again, uh, highly dependent, the, the effectiveness of those economies and the positive impact they have on job creation and economic activity will be enabled by the underlying mobility and, and transportation infrastructure. From a productivity experience, um, I, I cannot agree more with what Sashin said around, we've got to move away from uh, linear thinking around our infrastructure to uh, some kind of exponential thinking where we focus on how do we drive mileage densification of people, transportation, logistics, effective logistics planning, pit to port and uh, densifying uh, the, the, the loads that we carry. So we, we don't have empty loads being transported up and down our roads, but rather dense roads, which is uh, dense loads, which is uh, uh, super uh, uh, productive. Um, and then I just want to pause on, on, on the whole conversation we had around EVs. EVs, without a doubt, uh, if we look at it in today's perspective as a South African, it is expected, uh, expensive. However, if we embrace uh, two, two laws, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the um, Moore's law, which basically says any technology will double in capability in, in halving price every 18 months, uh, together with uh, uh, rights law, which speaks to battery power, what we are seeing is that EV vehicles today, uh, from a total cost of ownership in the Northern Hemisphere, is, is less than a Camry, uh, a Toyota Camry. And I'm talking about EV vehicles with a 350 mile uh, range. And, and the, the sticker prices of those vehicles are expected to drop below traditional vehicles in 2025. So we're seeing that rapid drop off. And, and this is specifically driven by the efficiencies in batteries that we're seeing and the reduction in battery prices. So rights law indicates that every time we double the capability of a battery, we reduce its cost by a third. So, um, you know, uh, if you take a look at it from a mileage perspective, the cost per mileage, um, uh, you know, a year or two ago is about 70 cents uh, per mile. Um, in, in the next three to four years, we'll probably see that drop into about 20 cents per mile. And that becomes the explosive price where adoption drives will expand dramatically, not just to individuals, but to things like um, um, uh, people, transportation, uh, autonomous ride hailing, et cetera, which is expected to be a, a multi-trillion dollar market as well with companies like Waymo, Baidu, Tesla, uh, you know, pushing that out uh, into the market. Um, from an experience perspective, and then I'll, I'll pause there for a second. I mean, uh, we spoke about the efficiencies of public transport, et cetera, but let's not take into account the importance of safety. You know, so as we try and optimize our infrastructure, uh, safety is a critical thing. Uh, I don't know if the stat is, is uh, uh, accurate, but uh, deaths on, on, you know, related to, uh, to road deaths, or, uh, I think is in the top 10 of, of the cause of deaths uh, around the world, or at least in, in, the, in, in uh, um, uh, developed economies. So I think as well, as we look at decarbonization, efficiency, et cetera, we've also got to look at, at safety, which is certainly, one of the main propositions that we that's under debate now from um, autonomous vehicles. And before anyone says autonomous vehicles are dangerous, I think what's important to highlight is that if you think of autonomous vehicles along five levels of safety, what we're currently seeing in the Teslas would probably be described as level two safety. Um, uh, and, and that already is probably uh, uh, safer than, than, than a human behind the steering wheel. You know, and ultimately, you know, these companies are trying to strive for like a a level four type safety. I don't think we'll ever achieve a level five safety based on the information that, that I read. And then just to throw the last spanner in the works, I think there's also the, the opportunity to go beyond the road. You know, so we're seeing a lot, uh, a lot of uh, developments and investments going into electric takeoff and landing, personal uh, mobility solutions, i.e. drones. Um, we're seeing a lot of experimentation in the transportation of small items. Um, and, and it's interesting, I'll certainly be watching that space to see how we integrate that into our uh, current mobility infrastructure to augment uh, the movement of items uh, and perhaps one day in the future, even perhaps the movement of people. Let me pause there. Thank you so much, Walter. Thank you very much for that. I really um, enjoyed hearing um, your viewpoints and closing up um, the discussion and your take on the on on all the speakers thank you so much for that um, 
I have a, some questions as well, but I think we should just take a few comments that we got um, from the audience first, and then we can go back um, into the discussion. There was a comment from um, Paolo on uh, trains to connect the suburb areas to the cities is definitely the way to go. Uh, he lives in Cape Town and says that Cape Town suburbs don't have proper public transport or exactly what um, Walter just touched on now. It isn't safe or reliable to use. If workers have these options, they will leave their car at home. Um, and I think that is something that we should definitely um, think about and uh, take um, and take to heart. And then the uh, second uh, interesting comment was from Lynette. South Africa has huge space for implementing proper public transport and making it uh, accessible or accessible to everyone. So that is an opportunity that we could possibly look at. And um, the last interesting comment was um, no long-term and true sustainable solution will succeed without active and constant engagement from source to end user. And I think that is critical. So now I'm going to open the floor to the rest of the speakers. And um, the one thing that I would like to highlight um, from everything that was discussed today and ending off um, with Walter, it seems to me that digital infrastructure is key to sustainable uh, transport solutions and um, making sure that the customer has a seamless um, transport experience. If we are going to integrate transport and have and encourage people to use different modes of transport, we need to make sure that the digital infrastructure is in place. Um, we have the right skills for making sure that digital infrastructure is in place and also that the infrastructure or the ICT connectivity that we have is reliable. And I do know that in Southern Africa, uh, for example, internet connectivity is definitely unreliable at the moment. So how do we tackle these? Um, because without uh, uh, effective digital infrastructure, all these ideas that we are talking about now um, might not be effective and will affect the user experience. So um, I will hand over to perhaps I, Peter to yeah. give us his input on that. Well, you've got 30 seconds left, haven't you? Uh, are you supposed to finish at half? Yes, half we, have, um, we have another 10 minutes. We have, oh, I good. have, we are extending the time for another 10 minutes. So thank you very much for that. I rushed through my presentation in three minutes or so. So I just would like to say a few things about the others as well. Um, look, I, I, I think you're right about digitalization, but I don't think it's the most fundamental thing. You can get a very good public transport system without that. You can have very good micro mobility without that. It will work a lot better if you can have good systems, apps that show you how to when, when the buses are coming and how to integrate it with other things. All of that can help, but it's really about priorities, as Christopher said, and the willingness to shift away from the, uh, using street spaces for just for cars. And that really gets down to engagement as the last. Uh, person said engagement is critical the community has got to drive these agendas um, in, in Perth which is an outer suburb of South Africa as you know we um, very similar climate and um, many similar aspects of our economy um, our, our uh, railway system was closed down um, and we fought it to get it back and it's gone from 7 million passengers a year to 70 million passengers a year. And there are seven new rail lines being built now. It's entirely based on the political system. You can win these things politically and the people will get behind it. And that's why I think it's very important 
to have visions like have been presented today and they're pretty consistently saying let's get rid of cars as much as we can and get decent public transport and decent integrated micro mobility and that can all be electric and very much fitting in with a 21st century agenda but it's totally up to the community to to drive that through the system in my experience that's what's changed perth Great, thank you so much, Peter. I see we have eight minutes left. So I think what I'm going to do is to give each speaker um, about two minutes just to uh, comment on what was shared and to give uh, their viewpoints. So uh, from Peter, we will go to uh, Carl. There were um, a lot of uh, issues raised um, with uh, what you had uh, presented. I'm not sure if you want to answer to that. There was a comment raised about uh, reaching price parity with uh, petrol and diesel, uh, uh, electric vehicles reaching price parity with petrol and diesel vehicles by uh, 2025. Uh, what is uh, uh, your take on that? And also um, the other uh, uh, colleagues' uh, viewpoints that were presented um, or shared uh, during this discussion. Adam, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a passionate topic for me, um, being involved so long for, with it and not seeing successes initially for the initial years is, is actually heartbreaking in many respects. But the reality is that things are changing. Um, although I agree that Yes, vehicles, how life costs for a vehicle, an EV is cheaper than, than a normal uh, combustible uh, engine vehicle. Um, the reality is it's not been taken up. Why not? And it might not be cost. I've never said it's too expensive, that it's too expensive for me, but it might not be the case for others. What I'm saying is, and, and it was mentioned earlier, the more things, um, more people are using a specific uh, approach, the cheaper it becomes. So public transport is the answer. And, and certainly we see it in South Africa that public transport, there's a great need for public transport, but it's not safe and it needs to be improved upon and that was raised as well. Then micromobility and, and just for, for comment, I've, I was a professional cyclist many years ago <clears throat> and when I moved to Johannesburg, I stopped cycling altogether, totally, because of safety and because of the fact that there's no place to cycle in, in, in Johannesburg. Um, you, you're actually putting your hands, your life at risk if, if you go on a bicycle on the road in Johannesburg. So that's the reality. And that needs to change. Um, it's a simple solution. Just get places where people can, because I, I, Stayed nine, I stayed nine kilometers from my office. And then sometimes during the load shedding periods, it took me up to an hour to get home or back. It's ridiculous. I could have cycled, I could have walked faster than that. But there's, but there's risk in doing that, especially cycling in, in Java. But even when walking, there's risks in that as well. And I think that's perhaps one of the key uh, issues that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. I think um, on that note, we will move to uh, Sashin to just give uh, your final comments and maybe perhaps um, some of your views on uh, what was shared from the other uh, speakers. Thanks, Edom. I, I really enjoyed the discussion and the debate. Um, you know, just, just to cover what everybody said, um, you know, Carl presented some very interesting insights on other low hanging fruit that we should be strongly looking at and adopting uh, in terms of uh, achieving net zero. Um, Christopher um, presented a lot about urban development planning and, and sustaining mobility there. And I think for us as Central, even though we don't primarily run through urban corridors, once a development happens uh, next to us, we eventually become a city around our network. So let's start adopting those principles now instead of waiting till we have the problem when there's no space. Um, Peter, 100%, uh, we, we really need to get the community behind these ideas and we really need to change the political will 
of uh, our mindsets. And uh, I, I love the the trackless tram, uh, electric trackless tram that you shared, and I'd really love to see it on the Sandra Road network operating as part of the public transport. And I couldn't agree with Walter uh, more. Um, you know, it's, it's such a multi-dimensional topic. And uh, one of the things that he touched on that we, we haven't even spoken about is the economic growth potential of a lot of these ideas. Just in a nutshell, can you imagine if we built a, a the micro mobility lane as sort of the Durban promenade style, um, where people have opportunities to have uh, shops and and the development it will attract in terms of uh, hotels and and uh, urban development. Um, so th there's an incredible amount of economic growth that is attached to all these other ideas that we also need to explore. Uh, and just in closing, you know, like you said, sustainable mobility requires um, radical mind shifts. Move people, not cars. Move goods, not trucks. Thanks, Ida. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sashin from uh, Sanral. We will now uh, hand over to Christopher to give his final thoughts and, and viewpoints on uh, the information that was shared today. Great. Well, it, it sounds like there's a lot of alignment here um, that we're pretty clear on what needs to change. And now the, the real key is making sure that the funding gets behind that. And, and so I think we'd really call on the development partners, you know, development banks to really look carefully at their portfolios to see if the projects that they're supporting are in line with the sustainable urban development and mobility agenda, you know, because what we've seen is that we still have a lot of money um, going into massive uh, flyover highway projects um, in the middle of urban areas. And they're, they're definitely not serving the majority of the local residents. Um, they're in fact creating problems, you know, they're creating severance issues in communities, you know, in neighborhoods that were once connected. Now you have a a big uh, urban highway blasting through and and so people are not even able to cross the road to get to a local shop without walking you know a kilometer to reach the next footbridge so we we really need to look at the the funding and and make sure that funding is aligned with the kinds of things that we're saying you know so that climate protection and sustainable mobility are not just uh, rhetorical issues but that we're backing that up um, with the kinds of projects that are being developed thanks Thank you so much, Christopher. And just in one minute, if uh, Walter has any closing remarks, then we can wrap up the session. Uh, Walter, are you there? I think you may have dropped off. Okay, well, if uh, Walter has dropped off, we certainly um, enjoyed the uh, discussion and viewpoints that he had. Thank you. Oh, Walter, you back. Do you have any closing remarks quickly in less than 30 seconds? Uh, I, I, first of all, enjoy the conversation. A uh, couple of things. It's about economic development. Integration with all components of transportation and mobility is critical. Densification of people and goods transportation, I think, is vital. And then that experiential factor, make it make people want to use it, make it safe, uh, make it practical. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our distinguished speakers. I wish we had more time to carry on this interesting topic on sustainable transport and sustainable transport solutions and the decarbonization of transport. Thank you very much to Carl Stein. Thank you very much to Walter. Thank you very much, Christopher, Sheen, and Peter. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. If there are any further comments, I'm sure you can Get, uh, get them out to the organizers of this event and they will definitely pass them on to our speakers. I thoroughly enjoyed this session. Have a lovely day further and keep safe. Thank you very much.